Um, thanks for thanks for coming. So this was I thought it was probably one of the most interesting panels. The question of employment options. There's no shortage of enthusiasm here today and elsewhere, right? And the subject of this really question is living in. Uh, my own experience is you know, one foot in, in, in learning about uh, the world history and humanities, museums, and so forth, and the other in technology, where there's no shortage of demand for, uh, for developers. And so, uh, you know, I'll see a mailing list post that will say, we need Rails developers. You know, and we'll pay you a whole bunch of money. And I'll see another post that says, I've been, you know, two years after my graduate degree, and I'm, I'm still, you know, kind of doing something part time. And so hopefully, through some insights today, that individual and others will have a better shot at, uh, at living a professional in every regard. So why don't we do quick introductions, maybe? Microphone. Um, do you want to just pass? Yeah, this is not a. Uh, this guy doesn't work. I'm, I'm just going to yell. Please use the microphone. Yeah, I'm going to have a mic. I'm going to hear him. I'll shut up. I think you're on. Still on mute, please. Cool. Yeah. This guy's on. Oh, now it's on. Yeah. Hang on to what? That's not on. Okay. So why don't you do this? Why don't you just do a quick rundown? And if you get kind of what the person does now and maybe kind of what they did before to get there. And then what I was hoping we could do is spend a few minutes and just drill down on you know getting pretty much further than things like network. Right? That's the way we do it, is network. Uh, so if we get kind of some nuts and bolts insights, I think that would probably be much appreciated and then we'll do questions. So I'm gonna start down there. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Gardner and uh, I am, like Lee, I have my feet to different worlds too. I'm a, I'm a public school teacher and I do a lot of stuff with education and history. I'm also in uh, the, the public history and the things with historical societies and preservation and, and stuff like that. And um, so. Hi, I'm Allie. I am also a teacher and I'm working in a bunch of different places at the same time. I volunteer at the Metropolitan Waterworks Museum up in Chestnut Hill. I also work at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, a couple of stops down the red line. And I also go to school at Harvard. I'm, I'm a year away from graduating with a museum studies student MA. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm Eric Bauer. Uh, I'm the archivist for the Peabody Institute Library in Peabody. Um, pretty much, uh, I come from a, a historical background and what I can say uh, in terms of how I got here was uh, uh, mobile, uh, just being willing to move and move around the country. Hi, I'm Matt uh, Wilding, uh, and I'm the. Who's that? Yeah. So uh, I'm Matt Wilding, and I'm the uh, content director of the Freedom Trail Foundation. Uh, I've been there for about four years in that capacity. Uh, before that, I was a tour guide for the Freedom Trail from my college uh, for history at Southern University under Bob Allison and I'm finishing my uh, master's in history right now at UMass Boston. Uh, so we have the most traditional possible route to, uh, to a history job. Uh, my name is Link Hallowell. I'm a National Park Service Ranger at Gateway National Recreation Area in New York. Uh, Gateway, real quick description of the park, is a collection of natural and historic areas located at the entrance of New York Harbor. And I feel mostly with the history side. Um, and I have been with the National Park Service, this, this will be my 20th year. And uh, I got my job by accident. <laughs> Share that story with you. Hello, I'm Thomas Ketchell. I'm half English, half French, and I'm a historian, but I'm also an entrepreneur. And so um, I've set up a company. We've just moved here to Boston in the last month. And we're bringing history to the digital classroom. So I look forward to sharing my story later. All right, so here's what I would propose is the first question. And if people feel like it feels like, a, feel like that works, we'll do that. Otherwise, let's take a question from the audience. My suggestion is we talk about what is the most important thing a person needs to do to get a job where you work right now, or where you're associated with right now. Just real quick background I had a 
conversation with someone at a major historic site in, uh, in Boston, the Boston area, and uh, she had all of these insights that were just fascinating, including things like uh, people will take off the resume things like their cashier. She said that at our facility, um, almost everybody has to have a money. So it's actually really helpful for that to be on there. So somebody who feels like, oh, wait a minute, that waters down my kind of history credit, uh, instead would find a, a better shot than somebody who didn't have that experience. And that's something that surely nobody would know unless they actually talk to that person. So I put some insights on um, what it would take to get a job, where you work right now, which is so, or where you're associated with it. Uh, well, the job that actually pays money to me, um, I teach high school history. I had to get a bachelor of science degree in education. Um, I, once I had that, I had to get a master's degree, and I uh, got a master's degree in history to go along with that. And, um, you know, when I was an undergraduate, and um, my initial intention was to go right on to grad school and um, right from there and teach at, uh, at the college level. But after doing my student teaching, I found that I actually enjoyed teaching high school kids. Sometimes I question that choice, but um, it, you know, my my undergraduate mentor, um, when I told him that I actually was uh, getting a lot out of the experience of student teaching and I liked it, he said, "You know, you might want to go with that. Said, this might be the only time you like it. You will actually make some decent money in history." Um, and uh, he's right because you know when I and my MA now and looking at like picking up adjunct positions and things like that. Um, it's the the causal is that the jobs are really difficult and don't pay a lot. Um, just you know, right up front there's not you know you're not gonna really make a good living at all these adjuncts. For all uh, that you get out of the experience of uh, in the immersion of being in history an intellectual venture, you know. Um, and there's some of that uh, with being a high school teacher um, too, so I, I'll take that wherever I can get it. And everything else that I do, it's really just a matter of having, of, of volunteering, um, just putting myself out there as someone willing to, to help out. Uh, like I'm on, a, like I'm on a board of directors at a Historical Society, and that just happened because I volunteered to work on some exhibits and some writing that they had, um, and so they invited me onto the board, and that's been a very interesting experience doing that. Um, the town that I'm in, um, they wanted to set up a historical, um, a historic, local historic district. I volunteered for that, and I don't know why, but they asked me, well, how about if you chair this? So I, I don't know how I have the time to do that, but I'm doing it, and I'm learning so much about preservation, and there's like free training that comes along with all that stuff. So, but that would be the other side of it for me, is just, um, you know, put yourself out there to, to volunteer, and there's all kinds of opportunities that come about from that. Um, so, to get a job at Harvard, I don't even know how I got one, so just try would be my first, <laughs> because I'm not sure how I got it. Uh, the job that doesn't pay me, I just walked in and said, hey, I would like to volunteer for you. And just to, to add to what Lee said about keeping things like being a cashier on your resume, if you have customer service experience of any kind, put it on your resume. Because if you can interact with the public in any way, especially if you're doing it for eight hours, and by the end of the day, you're like, oh my god, I just need to get out of here. You, you have experience dealing with lots of people, dealing with the rush, dealing with like the frenetic pace that is being in a retail environment, don't take it off your resume. It's really important. Um, but just for the museum career in general, volunteer. Volunteer and keep volunteering because it will eventually pay off whether it's in the museum you're currently volunteering in or in a different museum that you just so happen to apply for a job at because they, everybody in the museum field respects the job that the volunteers do because so many museums could not exist without their volunteer corps. So just constantly volunteer, like put out there that you are willing to do the work and go in being energetic about the fact that you're volunteering. That's the best advice that I can give. 
Um, in, in terms of archives, the, at the institution that I'm at, I'm the owner of Ranger. I'm the only person in my apartment. I have nobody else. Um, one of the things that worked to my advantage was uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, I earned a master's in humanities from my Mount St. Mary's College. Uh, after that, I wound up uh, doing an interest, volunteering and interning uh, as in the administrative department of one museum. I worked as a preparator. Uh, did educate, worked in, did education. And then when I moved out here to, to work on my master's in history, uh, you know, I put myself out there and started to get into the things I really wanted to do, which was registration and archives. And so if I had all these wide variety of backgrounds, now that I'm at the institute that I'm currently at, um, it is my responsibility to put on all the programs. It's my responsibility to, to do exhibits both in the library and also online. It's my responsibility to be able to put all these wide variety of patrons. Um, and so the, the biggest thing that the advice that I can say beyond you know, just putting yourself out there and volunteering is to just get a wide variety of things as possible because that was one of the keys to, to my hiring was the fact that I had done all these other things um, and just in terms of things that I did leave on my resume, uh, I served in the AmeriCorps for two years. Uh, you know, so that bring myself out there and doing public service, the library being a public institution, that also worked to my advantage. Uh, so those are just a couple of things that I would say. To get a job where I work, um, it, depends, it kind of depends on what part of the job you're talking about. Because the Free Trail Foundation has uh, two real sections to it. One of them is, is the one you've probably seen, which is the people running around town in colonial costumes, uh, probably blocking you when you're trying to get a train or something. And to get a job in that, uh, my best advice is know somebody who works at the Freedom Trail Foundation, frankly. I mean, that's the way most people get it. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot of that going on. Um, you know, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. People vouch for people who, are, who they think will be good, and usually they've been very good. Um, but as far as being a, a person walking in, one thing I will tell you is that literally every single person who applies for a job as a guy at the Freedom Drill Foundation gets an interview. Every single person who has ever applied. I've been there eight years. It's been hundreds of interviews. Hundreds of them. And Sam Jones, who's our creative director, he just will interview anybody. And that's where you can shine. Uh, so going into an interview like that, Know a little bit about the Freedom Trail. Know a lot about one site, not the Boston Common. They don't want to hear about that anymore. Uh, and uh, so know, know a good amount about the thing you're talking about and be willing to confidently speak in public. Uh, that's a thing that I think is a real problem for folks who are uh, who gravitate towards history. A lot of them uh, are much more comfortable in an archive. They're a lot more comfortable talking to dead people. Uh, and that's really not our function. Our function is to talk to living people about it. Uh, so for a guy, that's my recommendation. For the office, it's a little bit of a different thing. Uh, that's where I work now and where I've been for the past four years as a content director there. Um, the way people have gotten jobs in the office has almost exclusively been working in a way of uh, Sam Jones, creative director, who started off as a guy. Uh, I started off as a guy. Uh, Tavia Malone started off as an intern. Uh, and then Dan Cabaila, who is our uh, education coordinator, uh, she just got lucky, and her professor, Bob Allison from Southern University, uh, is on our board, and he recommended her to be able to And she's great, so she deserves a job, let's <laughs> she does. Um, so that's how people get jobs in my, in, in my office. They, if they don't know somebody, they work their way up after totally killing an interview, which you're guaranteed to get. So the, option, the opportunity is there. I also just quickly want to address what literally everyone else has said about volunteering. I want to disagree with that. Um, Volunteering is a problem, and you, should, and you should do it if you want to do it. Uh, but I don't advocate volunteering at any historical organization just for the, for the sheer sake of getting experience. Volunteer for, volunteer for a historical organization that is doing a thing you think is interesting and that you think might be beneficial to you. Uh, but don't just, you know, don't volunteer at the, you know, the Your Town Historical Society uh, just to get history experience. They probably don't have the budget to ever hire you. And if you don't like what you're doing, you're just going to burn yourself out. So make sure if you're going to volunteer, volunteer somewhere you like. Personally, I've never done an paid internship. I've never uh, volunteered long term for a historical organization. Uh, I still got a job, so that's not it's not a prerequisite to getting a job. One quick comment. So we all have the experience of 
in the contact organization we have to see in their response. So these guys deserve credit for time. All sound. <laughs> that's that's quite a that's just quite a quite a
remember my parents were telling me why are you going to study history and when I graduated they were like you're never going to find a job. Turns out they were right, I couldn't find anything I wanted to do really. So I decided to go traveling and work. So I worked in Australia, I worked in Kenya, I ended up in China and I was working on all different things. So social media, I was doing renewable energy, just for my BA in history. Um, and I still had this passion for history and I wanted to go do something with it in my life. So I actually decided to create my own job. So I created my own company, which is called History, without the vows. Um, and what I did is now we're an organization with uh, four full-time employees, two part-time. And for everyone looking for a job, I mean, what we really look for is people who are passionate about history. But like Eric and Ali and he said, we really look for people who've got different skill sets as well, so who have some experience with working in teams and working with people. So what I would really suggest is just get out there, um, get some work experience. It doesn't have to be related to history. You can always come back to history. And um, yeah, if you're looking for an internship for the summer, just come to me after. So my suggestion is we try and make one question and then just break and that will allow people to ask uh, specific individuals uh, questions one-on-one, -on -one, and then the next session doesn't begin until 1.15, and Matt is the speaker for the session. Um, okay. I'll propose one question if anyone has a one they'd rather hear speak up. My question is, is there one thing that you've seen at some point that's killed a person's opportunity to get a job? So we come through the front door, we've done interviews, applications, something like that, but there's one thing that happens, and all of a sudden, that said, they're not going for it. Is that a good question? Do you want to ask another question instead? Okay, let's do that one real quick. Real quick. Uh, well, I didn't do any question because um, the museum that I, the historical society that I'm on the board for, um, they, uh, their executive director just to uh, she got a much better job, uh, well, not a better job, but working for what well, nationally known as uh, Slater Mill now. So she left, and now we had to fill the shoes. And so um, we had about 30 people apply for this job, and it was a wide range of people that applied. And um, you know, we ended up having to say, well, some people just had absolutely nothing really on their resume that applied. And uh, other people did, and tangentially. And uh, you know, that, that paper that they sent to us with all their information on it was key. You know, they, they really need to sell themselves. And reading through that, through all of these, you know, how much time does someone have really to, to look at your paper and say yes or no? Okay, I'm sitting there one night after school. I got a lot of work to do. I got to look through all these papers to figure out who we want to be. Um, and uh, you know, we ended up just out of all those thirty, we only interviewed six people. Um, so, in other people that we picked, again, a wide range of experience, especially people who are really good at grant writing and working in money, people who had um, done a lot of different kinds of projects, who had led things. Mark, let me start off with because we're going to have to go through this in the tune of three minutes off. Was there a particular you know, incident there the last, you know, where there was that one thing you saw that they misspelled the title of the position? Yeah. Or, well, that would be a very quick way for me to just say, I'm not even going to bother. There's so many of these things to look at that, you know, something like that, I just threw it at the bottom of the pile. Everyone else did too. Okay. I haven't had any experience hiring anybody, so I can't really answer that question. Right. Um, yeah, same here. I mean, I've had interns, but most of them, the only, all the ones that I've had, I have been just phenomenal. So, but in terms of hiring, that sort of thing, you know, <coughs> people who do not bring their resume, do not dress like an adult, and have been, do not know anything about the organization they're applying for, will not get a job. When you show up for your interview, show up like you want the job. And this is something that I, I picked up from my previous sales background. Ask for the job. You know, be confident. Say, listen, okay, when, when you, you know, talk about when you're hired, not if. Say, say things, you know, put things in kind of that in, in that frame, because that gets you confidently speaking about yourself and your own abilities. And the more confidence that you portray, for somebody like me, I see that and I know that you're going to be comfortable in front of a group of people explaining the site. 
Yeah. What I would say is don't copy paste your cover letter for every single job you apply to. You know, really try and tailor it for the organization you're applying for because you know we get so many and it's always you can always just read for it. So be careful with that. I know it's time consuming but it's really important. Okay, well, uh, quick note to that. Um, last several years I've, I've done startups and, and for that large organizations and in you know, the tech community and startup community there are great opportunities to network and meet people at those companies, meet the guys that started the company or whatever. And so while well, I started out the whole uh, you know panel saying we need to get beyond where we're just networking as kind of the the answer, um, certainly it's it's one piece. Right, of, of finding someone, and getting some exposure, and then having an opportunity to go further. Okay, thanks very much. Let's, why don't we take questions one on one? Is that okay? Or no, I just is? wanted to ask one more general question. Um, you said, you know, oh, cover letters, to make sure it's not copy and paste. As somebody who's written enough cover letters to basically make it like a part time job, I would love to hear more about when you look at a cover letter, what are you looking for? Because, like, the hundreds of cover letters I've sent out, and you never get any response, or you never get any feedback. There's never somebody saying, hey, Emily, your cover letter is great. I wish you would talk more about this. Then I would have hired you. Because it's sending you into a black hole. So basically, for any of you who have hired you, if you're reading a cover letter, what are you looking for? Are you looking for somebody to say, here's my experience, or this is how confident I am, or here are my friends and skills? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, for us, on the technical side, we love a cover letter that actually goes through our application on our website. And then highlights all the inaccuracies, for example, or say like, actually, this isn't very good. This isn't very good. And we actually really enjoy that because it's actually taking a look at what we're doing and giving us critical feedback. So, and that's one, one of our writers has actually um, did a cover letter like that. Talking exactly about your skill set, why it specifically relates to a problem that the organization has. So solve a problem, and then tell me why you're better than everybody else. Because that's really what you're doing. You don't like doing that. You really need to check. You need to prove to me in a, in a sheet of paper how, how great you are and how you're going to fix all my problems. And for a public institution, uh, the one thing I can definitely say is look at the mission. What is the mission of, of the library? What is the mission of the city? That sort of thing to tailor to that. When I get uh, resumes from, or cover letters from insurance, that's the first thing I look at. Uh, have they looked at the website? Have they looked at our collection policies? You know, can they relate what they want out of it to? what we have on our website. And when they do, the times they do, they're the ones that I call for here, or you know, the ones that don't are the ones that I just kind of, you know, they really just didn't take the time. Anyone else? Yeah, I would just repeat that, that pretty much the people that apply that had known something about the society, or the work they've done, or what our collections are about, that those are things that stood out from the rest that just were like blah, blah, blah. Uh, with a governmental organization, it's an application process. Very yeah. Do you, have you applied for parks in the show? Okay. Did you send cover letters with them? No. They don't read it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hate to be that, that one truthful with you, but it, they're going through, for many of these positions, thousands of applications. People like park service jobs. They get lots of applicants. Um, give them exactly what they're asking. The next park service job you apply for, give them exactly what they ask for, no more, no less. That they, they really the, like that. That was worth the price of admission. Okay, <laughs> thanks everybody. Thanks to the panelists.